SS Stearns bought a huge tract of coal and timberland and soon found the only way he could tap and bring his resources out was to create a railroad. The Southern Railway already existed nearby, running north and south through the town of Happy Hollow, so all that was needed was an east-west connector into his land. So, in 1902, the name Happy Hollow was changed to Stearns, and the Kentucky and Tennessee Railroad was built, extending about 21 miles west to Bell Farm. Two years later, the line's name was changed to the Kentucky and Tennessee Railway, and many years after that, the line was shortened to a length of approximately 11 miles, terminating in a spot named Oz. Baldwin built 2A2 Mikado No. 10, labors over the ruling 3.5% grade and around the 20-degree curves, hauling coal out of the mountains to the southern connection at Stearns. At the time these scenes were filmed, June 1963, the K&T also owned a similar size mic, Alco built number 11, and larger mic number 12, formerly Southern number 4501. In 1964, number 12 was sold to a private individual and was restored to her original 4501 appearance and number. She still exists today and occasionally makes excursion appearances. Number 10 drags empties west along the South Fork of the Cumberland River and over the huge Yamacraw Bridge. Since the K&T had no turning facilities, the locomotives always back to the west. at the mine, number 10 prepares to pick up her stern's destined loads.
Buffalo Creek and Gauley 280 Consolidation Number 13 was built in 1920 by the American Locomotive Company as manufacturer's number 61579. Both her and another loco, number 14, came over to the BC&G from the Kelly's Creek and Northwestern Railroad. The Buffalo Creek and Gauley's purpose till its mid-1960s farewell was to haul empty hoppers from the Baltimore and Ohio connection at Dundon, West Virginia, up to a coal mine at Wyden, and of course, return with loads for the B&O. Number 13 leaves Swandale heading for the mine. at Wyden. The Buffalo Creek and Gauley had a Y at Wyden. And here, number 13 executes a turning movement for the haul back to Dundon. Concluding our visit to the BC&G, we're aboard a number 13 pushed bridge train.
The Dixie Sand and Gravel Company was located at Puddle Dock, Virginia, and the following scenes were filmed on June 3, 1949. 040T number 3 was Vulcan number 3183, built in 1921. This operation dredged sand and gravel from the nearby Appomattox River and produced aggregates for the building industry. August 11th, 1948, found Mr. Teamy at Pembroke, Virginia, filming the three-foot narrow-gauge Pembroke Limestone Company's operations. Several Vulcan-built saddle tankers were used in hauling the limestone aggregates. Mr. Teamy visited Richmond's David M. Leah Company on May 26, 1953, and filmed several sequences involving H.K. Porter built locomotive number one and Alco Cookworks 1924 constructed number three.
April 2nd, 1954 is the date, and the location is Richmond, Virginia. Here we'll take a look at the Virginia Electric and Power Company's huge 12th Street station. The company's 12th Street station utilized locomotive number 836. She was a so-called fireless cooker, built as HK Porter number 7228 in August of 1936. This 040 had no firebox and steam was supplied from the power plant. This unusual engine had a most unusual whistle constructed from conduit tubing. The Tredegar Iron Company's 060T No. 4 was formerly a U.S. Army locomotive. February 22, 1956 finds her working at the Richmond Located Industry.
The Old Dominion Iron and Steel Company was another Richmond-based industry, and Mr. Teamy paid a visit to its Belle Isle location on March 21, 1956. 040T Locomotive Number 3 was built by Alco Schenectady Works as number 2200 in the year 1886, and originally carried the name John Younts while being utilized as Alco shop switcher. The Norfolk-located Eastern Gas and Fuel Associates was filmed in 1957. This facility was formerly a U.S. Navy fuel depot, where coal was piled up on the ground until needed. 060T No. 1 pushes hopper cars on the fuel dock, where they are literally banged together to effect unloading. Later on, this became the New England Coal and Coke Company.
Chartered and organized in 1914, the Virginia Blue Ridge completed a 12-mile stretch from Tye River to Woodson the following year, and in 1916 added another 6.7 miles from Lowesville to Massey's Mill. The VBR was largely a timber product hauler, but in the beginning also fielded two round-trip passenger trains daily. Within a year, however, this was reduced to once a day, and by the early 30s depression years, passenger service was eliminated. By the time Mr. Timmy arrived on the scene in 1951, the road was reduced to a seven-mile section between Piney River and Tye River, Virginia. O60 number five was originally built for the U.S. Army by Alco in 1942 and carried number 4008 while in military duty. Here she'll start off at Piney River and head over to Tye River where she'll set off cars at the Southern Railway's interchange. Consolidation number six was 1907 Baldwin built as manufacturer's number 32312. She first went to the Southern, where she was classified H4 and number 385. The Virginia Blue Ridge bought her in 1947, and she became probably the most well liked locomotive on the line. Passing through Rose Mill, she heads for the American Cyanamid Company's titanium dioxide plant at Piney River.
After a hard day's work, number six deserves and receives a thorough cleaning up. Nineteen fifteen Porter built consolidation number one sits idle in the Piney River engine house. Sunrise at Piney River finds Alco nineteen forty two built O six O number eight at the calling dock. She was formerly U.S. Army number forty thirty eight.
Snow is the word of the day on January 21st, 1961, as number eight powers a train over the line. Locomotive number seven was another ex-U.S. Army 060, this one being built by Lama in 1944. She came over to the VBR from the Norfolk and Portsmouth Belt Line in 1956 when that road dieselized.
including our visit to the Virginia Blue Ridge Railway, we'll take in a few more scenes of 060 number 8 doing her job. September 1949 finds 1913 Baldwin built Norfolk Southern 280 Consolidation Number 211 working at Carolina Junction, Virginia. video, Shays, Lumbering, and more. This show's segment on the Elk River covers the company's coal operation, filmed by Mr. August Timmy between the years 1955 and 59, and handled by Rod Locomotive Number 16, a light Mikado purchased from the Savannah and Atlanta Railway of Georgia. So-called Dundon Coal was extracted from the Rich Run Mine at Wyden, West Virginia. This particular type was noted for its hardness, relatively low sulfur content, and the high fusing point of its ash. All this added up to a coal which could be handled and shipped without breakage and was used by many industries, especially where automatic stokers were part of the process involved. West of the mine in the town of Wyden was a dump where the mine tailings, known as gob in the mining industry, were deposited. The train of side dump cars headed out of town into a switchback and then to the locally called gob pile for dumping. This 282 was originally number 502 on the SNA and was built by Baldwin in 1919 as construction number 52301 with 57 inch drivers and 22 by 28 cylinders, hence the rather thin appearance.
pile at this time has been referred to by Mr. Timmy as stoking the fires of hell since a recent lightning strike set the entire mass on fire from top to bottom. Later on, this inferno was controlled by flooding and capping with clay. that kick. The air dump cars are emptied and number 16 shoves off back to widen for her next train load. By the way, the Elk River Coal and Lumber Company's Dundon Coal was hauled up to the Baltimore and Ohio's main line at Dundon by the Buffalo Creek and Gauley Railroad, which junctioned the Elk River line at Widen. Later on in this show, you'll see some BC and G action. About 20 miles north of Columbia, South Carolina, along the Southern Railway's line from Columbia to Charlotte, North Carolina, sits the town of Rockton. A short line extends 12 miles west from there to another small town, Ryan, thus the Rockton and Ryan. Filmed near Rockton in 1965, number 19 was a Baldwin 1906 built 2A2 Mikado, originally built for and purchased from the Birmingham, Alabama based Woodward Iron Company. for this line's existence was the hauling out of world-famous Winnesboro blue granite from the local quarries over to the Southern Railway at Rockton.
Saddle Tank 040T No. 1, seen here at Anderson Quarry, was used as the quarry switcher. backs a train of empties to the quarries. The E.J. Lavino Company had a huge plant located at Rusin's near Lynchburg, Virginia. This plant produced ferromanganese, a product used in the hardening of steel. O60 side tanker number two was built to World War II Transportation Corps specifications and is decked out in a royal blue paint job with yellow trim. Note the extra high auxiliary headlight so mounted to reach over the molten slag car which you'll shortly see. By the way, this locomotive now resides in the Virginia Transportation Museum at Roanoke. Self-propelled steam crane also works the plant. Switcher moves raw materials to the blast furnace. The ordinary workings inside the plant produce a spectacular display.
That material being lifted out of the gondola is the plant's finished product. Red hot molten slag is consigned to the dump area. The Norfolk and Portsmouth Beltline Railroad originated in 1898 as a joint venture of seven trunk line railroads, then serving the Norfolk, Portsmouth, and Berkeley area on Chesapeake Bay. With a total mileage of 26.9 miles, including trackage rights, it connected with the Norfolk and Western, Southern, Atlantic Coastline, Seaboard Airline, and all other railroads in the Tidewater area. 280 Consolidation No. 17 heads out of Virginia Beach. This locomotive was 1920 Baldwin built for the line. Consolidation number 44 was originally class H9 number 1298 on the Pennsylvania Railroad and is seen crossing the drawbridge over the south branch of the Elizabeth River at Norfolk. The same location finds another ex Penzi consolidation heading up a freight. Now number 41 on the NNPBL, she was formerly class H6 number 894. Number 54 is ex-U.S. Army 060, number 4051, and is seen near Sewell's Point. Another ex-U.S. Army 060, formerly 4061, now number 51, later went over to the Virginia Blue Ridge and can be seen in operation on the VBR in our video entitled Steam Locos on Industrial and Short Lines, Volume 1. The Interstate Railroad was a coal hauling road located in the southwestern tip of Virginia and connected with the Clinchfield, Norfolk and Western and Southern. In fact, the line was purchased by the Southern in 1961. August 1950 finds consolidation number four near Appalachia. Number 20 was a 1923 Alco Richmond Works built USRA type 2882 compound Mallee. Her 541,000 pound weight on eight pair of 57 inch drivers exerted 101,300 pounds of tractive effort to the rails. 
262 Mali number 23 was ex Norfolk and Western Z1A number 1322 and was acquired by the interstate in January 1937. Consolidation number 27 was a class KS3-280 off the Southern, originally number 2505, and came over to the interstate in July of 1952. The 1920 Baldwin built 280 consolidation number 5 switches Andover Yard. Note the unusual southern type valve here. And finally, also at Andover, old 1906 Baldwin consolidation number 1 swings by. The Nelson and Albemarle Railway was a 17-mile line extending eastward from a southern railway connection at Rockfish, Virginia, north of Lynchburg, through Schuyler and Esmont, and on to Alberine. The road's main purpose was to serve the soapstone quarries of the region and lasted from 1903 until operations were terminated on February 5, 1963. Filmed in the years 1949 and 50, We'll see in operation the Rhodes 262T Saddle Tank Steamers number 9 and 10. Both were built new for the NNA by the Vulcan Ironworks, number 9 in 1920 and number 10 in 1922. 9 was the largest of the two, weighing 148,000 pounds and riding on 46-inch driving wheels, while number 10 weighed only 112,000 pounds and was equipped with six 40-inch drivers. Not long before these films were made, the NNA owned only eight miles of track and ran six days a week from Schuyler to Esmont. Since that was a nine mile trip, one mile of the track was leased. As far as equipment other than the locomotives, none were owned. Even the station shop and engine facilities were rented. Passenger Combine, which one week took in a gross passenger revenue of 30 cents, was barred from the Chesapeake and Ohio in partial payment for the NNA servicing the CNO's six miles of track between Esmont and Warren, where it connected to the James River Division. In mid-1948, there was only one train at a time on any portion of the rails. At 9 a.m., it left Schuyler as train number two to Esmont and arrived back as train number three at 10.40 a.m. Then at 11 a.m., it leaves again from Schuyler as train number four, and when it passes through Esmont, it becomes CNO train number 210 to Warren. The return trip begins as CNO number 209 at 2.15 p.m. and becomes NNA number five at Esmont, arriving at Schuyler at 4.35 p.m. At that time, 90% of the road's business consisted of bringing in supplies to the Alberine Stone Corporation of Virginia and hauling out its products laundry tubs, lab sinks, tabletops, architectural stone, and powdered soapstone. Pulpwood shipments out of the local area rounded out the balance of the freight business, and as hinted to before, passenger revenue was practically non-existent.
Breaking the Rails is Mr. J.I. Kelly, a local rail fan, and that get-up on his head is no more than a paper bag strategically placed to break the freezing cold wind. The Standard Gauge Carolina Southern Railway was a 22-mile line running from an Atlantic coastline connection at Ahoskie to Windsor, North Carolina. The following scenes were filmed in 1949 and 50 and show Locomotive 100 running at Windsor, Askewville, Barry's, Cremo, and Powellsville. 260 Mogul No. 100 was built in 1923 by Cook as Construction No. 65201 and was intended for a sugar mill in Cuba. It was never delivered to its original customer and was sold by the American Locomotive Company to the Carolina Southern in 1927 as an unsold item in new condition. The locomotive carries the name R.P. Slaughter, so named for the general superintendent of the road. This line started out in 1898 as the Wellington and Powellsville Railroad, a three-foot narrow gauge road. After World War I, business declined to a point where, in 1926, the W&P was sold under foreclosure. The following year, it was reorganized as the Carolina Southern and rebuilt as a standard gauge line. serviced at the engine terminal at Ahoski. Ten-wheeler locomotive number 104 was built in 1922 as construction number 55274 by Baldwin and started out its working life as number 655 on the Lorenberg and Southern Railroad. Sit back and enjoy views of the Carolina Southern from the locomotive, caboose, and line side.
An example of the long gone practice of polling is coming up. Concluding our visit to the Carolina Southern, 104 passes over the bridge at Cremo. The Shenandoah Central Railroad was a unique, mile-long, three-foot narrow-gauge line that was constructed on a farm owned by Dr. Paul S. Hill at Penn Laird, Virginia just outside Harrisonburg in the Shenandoah Valley. Designed as an operating museum of narrow gauge equipment from the old East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, the motive power will be provided by 1917 Baldwin built 10 wheeler number 12, affectionately known as Tweetsie. Sheep had the run of the land until the line was built and we'll take a look at views during the road's construction. and were quite a success for a while until a hurricane caused flooding which destroyed the right of way and ended the Shenandoah Central's career.
A steam locomotive ran at Washington, D.C. as late as 1960. The United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, St. Elizabeth's Hospital 040T No. 4, was built by Porter in 1950 and was, in fact, the last steamer built by them. Her duties were just to haul coal from a Baltimore and Ohio branch line to the hospital's power plant and return the empties, never to leave the grounds. Fort Eustis Military Railroad was located near Lee Hall, Virginia, just outside of Newport News, and had a connection to the Chesapeake and Ohio. It operated as a training facility for armed service personnel, and could almost be considered the ultimate full-scale model railroad layout due to its inner and outer loops. May 1957 finds 280 Consolidation No. 610 at Hank's Yard. She was built by Baldwin Lima Hamilton as construction number 75503 in 1952 and was in fact the last commercially built reciprocating steam loco built for a domestic railroad. Number 614 was an 060 switcher coming out of the American Locomotive Company plant during the Second World War in 1942.
Consolidation number 611 was a Baldwin product and was constructed in 1943. After overseas duties were completed, she was returned to the United States and rebuilt with Franklin poppet valve gear by Vulcan in 1949. A crosshead driven gearbox transforms the reciprocating motion into a suitable form for short travel cams which operate the inlet and exhaust valves. Overall, this style valve gear was considerably more efficient than long travel reciprocating types. This locomotive was the last operating poppet valve equipped engine which operated in the country. some May 1955 views of number 610 in action. Constructed consolidation number 620 works the road. finds consolidation 606 and 612 double heading at various locations around the base. Thank you. 
visit to Fort Eustis concludes with 606 and 612 running parallel near Sea Lock on June 13, 1960. As mentioned in our Elk Creek coal and lumber portion of this show, we'll take a short look at some Buffalo Creek and Gauley action. Locomotive number 14 was an Alco 1917 built 280 and was formerly number one on the Kelly Creek and Northwestern, another short haul West Virginia coal line. Here, she passes Crestmont with 56 empty hoppers headed for the Rich Run Mine at Wyatt. Consolidation number four was Baldwin 1926 built as construction number 59472 and here in April 1957 crosses Buffalo Creek. partially buried girder is the remnant of the original dynamited bridge and is a reminder of the labor problems that befell the railroad in the year 1952. Probably a little known fact was that the Norfolk and Western owned a three foot narrow gauge line, albeit was confined to the East Radford Tie Treating Plant. Operating here is 040T number three, originally constructed by Vulcan in 1916 for the Inland Steel Company and later acquired by the NW. Typically, ties were bundled and shoved into an airtight chamber where after being sealed in and subjected to a vacuum, were treated with an injection of creosote coal tar. Accidental fire destroyed this plant in the late 1950s, and number three was scrapped in 1957. Steam is gone, and so goes the RF&P coal wharf at Richmond's Aka Yard.